Um, as Mohammed said, this is uh, this talk is called Using Causal Inference to Test uh, Software Systems, and it's the sort of theme of um, a grant um, that that was started um, relatively recently. Um, it's sort of been going on for well uh, a couple of years. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'd like to sort of take the opportunity just to sort of say what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. Um, and this is part of the uh, SITCOM project. So the project is called Causal Inference to Test Computational Models. And that acronym um, took a lot of time to come up with. So very proud of it. Um, good. OK. Um, so our story um, actually starts uh, 100 years ago uh, in a guinea pig laboratory at the US Department for Agriculture um, on the outskirts of Washington. Um, so there, there was a man called Sewell Wright, and Sewell Wright was interested in the role of ge genetics in determining fur patterns. Now, please don't be alarmed, this isn't uh, going to turn into a, a big lecture on, on, on guinea pigs and fur patterns, I, I will come to the testing bit, right? Um, but you'll see why shortly. So Sewell Wright's challenge was basically how can I breed guinea pigs um, that don't have too much colour on their coats, so without patterned coats? So the theory of the day was that this was completely genetically determined. Um, so basically, if you had a pair of parents without too much pattern on their fur, then you'd get offspring without too much pattern on their fur. But hundreds of lab experiments by, by Sewell Wright suggested that this wasn't entirely the case. Um, so he ended up conjecturing that there must be other factors at play. Um, there might be, for example, developmental factors. So things that happen in the womb that determine um, the fur pattern, or perhaps environmental factors. So after the guinea pig was born, conditions in the cage or the feed that might have an impact on, on the fur again. And obviously there was the genetic makeup of the parents, that was obviously a factor, but couldn't be the only one. Now, he wanted to explore this, but the problem was that these factors that he was hypothesizing about are actually very difficult or were impossible to control at the time. You couldn't, for example, just do a randomized control trial where you control how the guinea pig develops in the womb. OK, so it was a really interesting um, challenge from that point of view. So. The way he went about it was basically a sort of two-phased approach, and he adopted a very novel approach for the time. And his approach is de uh, described in, in this paper uh, referenced at the bottom. Okay. Um, so what he started off by doing was to just run um, a couple of experiments where he would, in one experiment, he basically um, randomly selected pairs of guinea pigs and bred them. Um, and then he looked at the correlation in terms of between the, the, the absence of pattern on the fur of, for example, the sire, which is the dad in guinea pig terminology, and the dam, the mother, uh, the sire and the son, the sire and the daughter, the dam and the son, the dam and the daughter. Um, and he got the sort of correlations in coat, um, coat colour from them. Um, and because the question of inbreeding was also um, something that they were considering, they also did um, a, a, a number of experiments where they sort of bred um, guinea pigs from the same litter and tried to try to get them to look at the, the look at the coat colour um, correlations between them. Um, and one thing that stood out was that the correlations were actually very low. OK, and this was essentially what the, the challenge he was grappling with. So it doesn't matter, um, you know, if you just look at the coat colours of the parents, for example, the highest correlation you would get is 0.23. So there must be other factors at play. So how could he then figure out what these other factors were? The way he went about doing that was to take his own hypothesis and to try and draw it out in a graphical format. OK, so he said, right, we have the sire and the dam and they will either produce offspring that have a largely white coat or they will have put um, produce offspring that don't have a largely white coat and there must be other factors at play here 
And the factors he determined were that there's probably some developmental factors. Um, there might be environmental factors. Um, there's definitely hereditary factors there. So the correlations told him that much. Um, and the genetic makeup of the parents probably plays a role as well. And obviously there's a degree of randomness here as well. OK, so basically he took all of his knowledge, his domain knowledge about and his suspicions about about what he was trying to analyze and he set them out in this path diagram. And what you see here is also that each arrow shows how the different factors affected um, different components. OK, and, and each um, each of these small letters there is basically a coefficient, right? So that shows the extent to which for example, environment affects X, Y, and Z. So what he realized was that once he'd done this, he actually, in effect, had a set of equations. Um, and not only that, but for some of the factors, for example, the extent to which the genetic makeup of the dam and the sire affect the offspring, he knew that that value, the value for A, would always be 0 0.5. You always get half of the genetic makeup of your parents. So he knew that there were con some constraints there. And he was also aware of the kind of um, outcomes that he was looking for. So, for example, um, the correlations. And basically what he then did was. He identified from his path diagram um, a set of equations that was comprised of the different um, coefficients. And he then reverse engineered so he basically by manipulating the equations and by taking into account um, the, the, the correlations from the correlation data, he was able to work backwards and from that figure out what the necessary values of H, E and D must be. And he found that when he basically plugged in um, the, the appropriate values for H, E and D into these equations, they would perfectly explain the correlations that he'd observed um, in the sort of superficial data. Um, and for anyone who's interested, he determined that actually 58% um, was the was the answer. So developmental factors um, had a, sort of had a 58% um, causal impact on the on the pattern of the offspring uh, guinea pigs. Um, so that's an interesting sort of story because that ultimately sort of set the foundations for what we now know um, as as causal inference. OK, so causal inference is basically um, this sort of family of analysis techniques uh, and it's a very broad one um, and it's specifically good for situations where you have causal questions about how one variable can or cannot or the extent to which it does or does not affect another variable, um, where the variables are perhaps hard to scrutinize directly, um, and where there might be some confounding, where you could have lots of variables that can interact with each other to affect another variable, and you have to try to disentangle um, the precise sort of causal interrelationships at play there. Um, so the way it works is that um, you have um, your scientist um, and they've collected perhaps some data or they've observed some data of the phenomenon that they're interested in uh, and they have some question um, about that phenomenon. So, for example, to what extent does Y cause Z? Um, and it's based on this premise that, as with Sewell Wright, they are able to provide some domain knowledge um, in the form of a directed acyclic graph. So this basically sets out the variables that are at play and it shows how individual variables can directly affect other individual variables. OK. And basically, once you have that, um, you can. So what's useful about this DAG, I should add, is that, for example, if you wanted to know the effect of variable y on z, um, this graph would say you can't just naively look at the data and look at the relationship between y and z because we have this variable w here that is actually could be a confounder because we know that it affects both y and z. So you can't be sure as to 
whether you know if you just look at uh, y and z sort of naively without controlling for w you might you might get a misleading answer right um, so what causal inference does is it basically um, systematizes this so it takes the question you're interested in it takes the the graph and it gives you what it calls an s demand which is basically a recipe whereby you can um, analyze the data whilst controlling for the potentially confounding variables um, and then ultimately um, if you then take data and you apply um, the estimate to that data you get um, an answer that gives you um, a definitive causal answer so it's the so you can say that this is definitely a causal relationship because I've controlled for all of the other ways in which the the data might be confounding my answer OK, um, and it's worth highlighting that the, the process of analysing the data is completely separate from the data itself. OK, so you, you, you keep them as separate. Um, the other thing you can do um, with this knowledge in the DAG is um, you can also take it a step further. So if you know how different variables in the DAG might affect the outcome that you're interested in, um, you can also sort of apply sort of traditional machine learning techniques. But if you wanted to, for example, create a regression model to um, predict the outcome of some variable, instead of making that regression model analyze all of the variables in the data set, the DAG tells you that actually you only need to focus on those variables that can directly affect um, the outcome that is of interest. So it helps you produce much more, in theory, much more accurate and precise uh, and definitively causal models um, as a result, which then enables you in principle to answer questions about data that you haven't seen before and make, make sort of accurate causal predictions. Um, so that would then, you know, you, you get the, you, you instead of just analysing the data um, sort of in a backward way, you infer a regression model and you look you look forward and you you answer hypothetical questions about the data so um, as a result um, causal inference is sort of um, developed into a very vibrant research area uh, you see it across lots and lots of disciplines um, social sciences economics health sciences so our collaborator here at Sheffield who's the causal inference expert actually sits in the School for Health and Related Research and applies it to cancer, cancer trial data, for example. Um, and it's obviously big in, in, in computer science as well. You've got um, sort of big leaders in the field such as Judea Pearl uh, and so on. Um, and it's developed lots of research directions and there's a growing number of tools. Um, and these two tools on the right are worth pointing out because they're really um, quite easy to play with. So um, Daggety is a is a sort of a, a causal DAG analysis tool that, that gives you these S demands that I was talking about earlier, and you can just go online and play with different DAGs. Um, then Do Y is, is quite a fully featured um, Python library that was uh, initiated at Microsoft, again, that, that you can use to play with it. And that, that factors into our work as well. Um, so that was a kind of a a very brief whirlwind tour of, of causal inference to try and set the scene. Um, and Sewell Wright did his work in 1920, uh, 21, uh, and, and a bit after that. So um, what I want to do now is, 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 is bring things forward a bit where we sort of bring things to the sort of testing question. And uh, we're going to come to Downing Street uh, 100 years later, which was um, in 2020, OK? I'm not sure whether this is going to work over um, over teams, so let's see. I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. OK, so that <laughs> that should probably come with a bit of a trigger warning. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, as we all remember very well, um, we were told to stay at home and the whole country was told to stay at home um, as were large swathes of the world. And um, certainly for the 2020 decision to lock down, um, that was very controversial at the time. And um, it was 
largely informed by um, a report that came out of Imperial College, um, as we're probably all aware, um, written by Neil Ferguson and his team. Um, and you see the sort of the Washington Post, right? So one of the things that's often forgotten is that that report didn't just lead to the lockdown in the UK, it also led to the lockdown across the US. Um, so a chilling scientific paper helped to upend US and UK coronavirus strategies um, behind the virus report that jarred the US and UK into action. So it was seen as quite shocking um, because um, the, the report predicted um, that um, if things carried on as they were, um, then it would lead to very rapidly, um, well, a, a disastrous scenario where the, the hospitals would be um, over um, overstretched and, and there would be lots of deaths. Um, so that report was um, to a large part based on the results of a computational model. And that computational model was called COVID-SIM. Now, um, I spent a lot of the time when I was writing the, the case for support for this grant, trying to find compelling um, evidence of situations where computational models had led to um, big impacts with potential um, sort of business critical implications and so on. And, and I didn't have something like this to refer to, but this is certainly a good example of a situation where a computational model can really lead to multi-billion um, dollar pound uh, livelihood uh, kind of impact. Right. Um, so in the aftermath of this, um, there was um, probably a lot of a lot of scrutiny of the decision making, and there were lots of requests to see um, the the model that had led to the outcome. And uh, shortly afterwards, there was this tweet um, from from Neil Ferguson um, saying, "I'm conscious that lots of people would like to see and run the pandemic simulation code that we are using to model control measures against COVID-19." Um, just to explain the background, uh, I wrote the code um, thousands of lines of undocumented C over 13 years ago to model uh, uh, flu pandemics. OK. Um, um, and then shortly afterwards, there was a follow up by uh, the celebrated uh, John Carmack, uh, celebrated programmer behind uh, Duke Nukem and Commander Keen, amongst other things, who was also then ended up somehow being involved in the project. And, and he confirmed this, that he said, um, you know, so before the GitHub team started working on the code, it was a single 15,000 line C file uh, that had been worked on for a decade. Uh, and some of the functions looked like they were machine translated from Fortran. Um, Actually, what he says later on in the thread is very complimentary about the, the state of academic code. But if we're looking at it here, we're a trustworthy computing node. OK, um, you look at this in terms of trustworthiness of the outcome of a, of a, of a com computational system. And there are some red flags there. Um, so this, is, this really gives rise to the question, OK, um, if you could go and test this system, um, how would you go about testing it? And this is this is the kind of question that we are grappling with at the moment. So what you can do is, is you can go on online and you can download um, the COVID sim. Um, and what I've got is a little snippet of um, of the configuration file um, for COVID sim. Um, it's only what I could fit onto the slide, because if you if you wanted to fit the whole configurations file onto a slide, um, you'd have to shrink it um to this okay um which is probably barely legible um so what you have there is 164 parameters um and there's a mixture of distributions and scalars some of them are harder to control than others um it's computationally very expensive to run um so going on a 2006 report of the sort of predecessor code um the us simulations full scale a single full scale US simulation would require 55 gigs of RAM and approximately 20,000 CPU hours. And so with today's hardware, that would obviously be much less, but still hard to test. OK, you can't just run it um, 100,000 times and, and get, uh, get the results you need. Um, and then finally, there's a limited understanding of the correct behavior. When this was deployed in 2020, um, there wasn't an understanding of what a correct 
output from a COVID simulation looked like because no one had encountered it before. So how do you even build an oracle to test this? Um, what you can perhaps do is reason um, about sort of individual properties. So for example, a larger population should imply that there's a higher absolute number of deaths. Um, prioritizing the elderly for vaccination should reduce the overall number of deaths if we accept that they're more vulnerable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you certainly can't get a sort of a global clear idea of what a correct result looks like. Um, so this isn't in and of itself new. Um, people have commented on, on, on scientific software and the hard of, uh, and the difficulty in testing it before. Um, so Andy, Andy Clark, who's doing a PhD on this project, he, he did a literature review of test case generation for um, for agent based models uh, references below. Um, and there's another um, more general um, survey on, on testing scientific software by Kanawala and Beeman, um, which which gives a really nice sort of broad overview of the challenges that you face when um, when testing scientific software. I'm going to pick up on two points from each, one point from each report here. Um, one of the things that Andy picked out was that when he sort of surveyed all of the um, uh, agent-based testing approaches that were out there, um, most of them were focused on um, sort of individual level testing. So if you had an agent-based model, the tests would focus on an individual agent or a unit or a, a small piece of the model. Now, in agent-based models, this is problematic because a lot of the interesting behavior comes from the interactions and the macroscopic um, sort of emergent interactions between the agents. Um, and that would be called society level testing. And he found that only a very small number of techniques actually looked at the high level emergent behavior that you get from, 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 from these agent-based models. Um, a point that Kanawala and Beeman raised, which we'll come back to later, was that they said one of the sort of most um, promising looking techniques when you can just sort of reason about behavior in terms of parameters was metamorphic testing. Um, and I'm just going to mention that here because we'll come, we'll come back to that a bit later. So if we step back again and we, 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 we go right back to the start, um, we started with um, Sewell Wright and his guinea pig experiments. On the one hand, we moved forward to uh, the COVID sim situation and the difficulty of testing the COVID sim situation on the other. And um, although it might not appear that way um, to begin with, there are lots of um, dualities between the challenge of analysing uh, guinea pig breeding and testing computational models. Um, for one, there's a lot of variables at play, particularly so with the COVID sim situation, but also um, with, with the guinea pigs, you've got your hereditary factors, genetic factors, developmental factors. Um, COVID sim, you've got hundreds of parameters. Um, in both cases, the task is ultimately to establish a causal effect between variables. So. Um, on the one hand, you, we're, we're looking at the causal effect between developmental factors and the coat colour. Um, on the other hand, we're looking at the, um, the, the question of whether um, prioritising the elderly um, leads to uh, a, a lower number of deaths, and, uh, for example. Um, some of the factors are very hard or even impossible to control and observe, and we obviously saw that again in the guinea pig example. Um, but also in the in, in COVID sim, um, if you're looking at inputs that comprise complex objects where you're not simply flipping a Boolean or changing a numerical value, controlling these in a in a useful way becomes quite hard. Um, you've also got in the in both cases, you've got a lot of randomness. We had chance in the in the guinea pig situation. And obviously, in a in a in an agent-based model, there's lots of stochasticity in terms of how agents move around and interact, and so on. Um, furthermore, each observation is expensive in terms of time and resource. Um, uh, breeding and gestating a guinea pig is time-consuming, um, and we had the thousands of CPU hours required for a single COVID sim uh, simulation. 
Um, and in neither case is the correct answer known. OK, so we don't know the, the effect of development on coat colour and we don't know how COVID spreads, or at least we didn't in March 2020. Um, and then finally, there's something that I haven't written on the slide here, but the people who need to analyse these systems and know these facts are not trained software engineers. Um, we have uh, scientists in the case of Sewell Wright. Um, and, um, you know, even more scarily, we have we have politicians um, who need to who need to understand the outcomes from these models and decide what to do with them. OK, uh, and that's also worth bearing in mind. Um, so so that brings us to the sort of work um, that we've been doing on sitcom. And uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things we've done to explore how to bring over causal um, analysis and causal inference into the testing. Um, but I'm going to caveat this with the fact that this is very much ongoing and in some cases very early stage work. Um, so so um, just just to bear that in mind. Um, some of the some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about here specifically um, have been released in a preprint um, by, by Andy Clark. Um, that's on archive if you if you want to follow up on some of this. Um, so for this, I'm going to draw upon a small case study. I'm going to carry out two causal analyses related to uh, an actual uh, computational model. Um, we're not going to look at Neil uh, Ferguson's COVID sim. Uh, we're going to look at a, a smaller, slightly more manageable uh, system called Covasim. Now, Covasim is by no means a toy uh, example whatsoever. It was developed um, um, again uh, for COVID-19 analysis. It's actually a very big model um, developed by the Institute for Disease Modeling, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It was developed to investigate hospital demands, effects of different vaccines, quarantine, lockdown restrictions and so on. And was crucially used to inform um, a lot of policy decisions in the US, the UK and Canada. Uh, and if you go to their GitHub page, which is down there at the bottom, you'll see a huge list of um, publications in the likes of The Lancet and Nature and so on that, that were derived from this work. So it's so it's a substantial model. Um, in terms of the testing challenge, it's got 64 unique parameters. Um, it also has long execution times um, and a, a potentially a high computational cost. Um, nothing like the sort of thousands of CPU hours that I was talking about earlier, but they can still be substantive. Uh, and there's a lot of random behavior in there. Um, OK, so what I'm going to start with is is by by sort of t looking at this specific scenario. OK, so we decided to start with a very specific and relatively simplistic question, but it gives a good idea of how you can sort of bring over um, causal inference into into software testing. So we, I mentioned this question earlier on. Um, which is of interest, um, which is namely what happens? Uh, what is the what is the effect of prioritizing the elderly for vaccinations? So if you wanted to sort of examine this question from a causal point of view, um, the first place to start is with a DAG. OK, so what we start with on the left, uh, these are the parameters or some of the parameters that we can give to Covasim. So prioritize the elderly as a Boolean. And then you've got, for example, the number of people who are infected within your initial population. You've got your whole population size um, and the number of days that you want the simulation to run for. And some of the things you might look for as output is um, the number of doses that are administered um, over the number of over these simulation days. Um, the total number of people that are vaccinated, uh, the total number of people that are infected. Um, and one of the factors that we kept an eye on was the maximum doses administered per agent. So then what we can do is, is add in um, some edges. Um, so the edges that we're particularly interested in I've highlighted in black and the other ones are in light gray. OK, so basically if there's an edge between an input and an output. It means that if we change this input, it should 
change, it should have some sort of effect on the output. OK, um, so prioritizing the elderly, we would expect to uh, affect uh, the number of doses administered. If there's no edge, um, then that's important as well. OK, so and this is important to bear in mind, we're not just interested in the presence of an edge. In many ways, the absence of an edge is even stronger because that's telling us that, OK, here, if we change the number of people who are initially infected, this should never, ever cause a change in the total number of people who have been vaccinated. OK, so both the presence or an absence of an edge um, are, are, are interesting. Um, so if we so if we want to start testing this, then what we can do is we can say, well, um, let's put some rules in there. OK, so we know we know what the causal relationships are and um, yes, we can we can establish whether there is a causal effect or not. Um, but what we can also do is then say, well, um, there should be some basic rules in play here. So, for example, Yes, I expect there to be a causal effect from prioritizing elderly on the total uh, number of people infected. Um, and I would expect it to go up. Hence the up arrow. Um, but whatever happens, um, the total number of people who are infected can never be larger than the population size. OK, that's just a sort of sanity check thing. Um, and if we accept that multiple doses are administered, so for example, if there's two doses that are administered, we say, OK, uh, if we prioritize the elderly, um, the number of doses administered will go up, but it can't go up beyond um, sort of two times the population size. So, so this was kind of our, this is a DAG that we've used um, to sort of specify how we want to test the system. Now, the next thing to do is to go away and to run the system. Um, because we're using causal inference though, we don't need to use this DAG specifically to run the system. Um, you can go and get um, some executions um, from wherever they are, but we'll come back to that later. What we did for this was we basically, because we were only interested in uh, prioritizing the elderly, um, we fixed all of the variables um, at their sort of default values. Um, so initial number of people infected, 1,000, population size, 50,000, number of simulation days, 50. Um, and then we ran it um, twice. Uh, sorry, we ran it for two sets of 30 executions. Um, for one set, we set prioritize elderly to true. And for the other set, we set prioritize elderly to false. Um, so if we look at the outputs um, and if you sort of just um, sort of, you know, carry out the analysis on that, you'll get um, these sorts of results here. So it'll say, OK, so the causal effect of um, changing prioritize the elderly on the maximum number of doses per agent is zero. Um, so this is the confidence interval. So from zero to zero, that's good. So that's correct. Um, and it says, OK, so the uh, impact on on the total number of people infect, infected is is kind of marginal, so it increases from uh, sort of a lower bound of uh, a lower confidence interval of 2,323 up to 2,475, which is as we expect. What was surprising, though, was um, when we looked at the results for um, the number of doses administered and the total number of people um, vaccinated. So what the model at the time told us was that um, if you flip prioritizing the elderly and switch it on, then the number of doses administered increases by between 480,550 and 482,152. So given that we have a population size of 50,000, there's either something very weird happens when you prioritize the elderly or there's a bug in in the system um, and as it turns out so so this was a sort of quite quite a useful exercise um, for Andy so Andy um, sort of reported this this bug and uh, it was kind of um, uh, verified and corrected um, sort of uh, a while afterwards um, 
but that, that sort of just gives you a sort of nice idea of how just starting from a relatively simple DAG um, and without requiring too much else, it's possible to kind of um, sort of derive uh, derive tests and derive test oracles that that, that will that will tell you about the correctness of, of, of the system. Um, and it does so sort of also <laughs> make you wonder to what extent bugs like this or even this bug could have found their way into policy documents if people were genuinely looking at um, at prioritizing the elderly um, or not. Um, but that's a question for another time. Um, so at this point, I said I'd come to metamorphic testing, and this is where I come to metamorphic testing. Um, so the thing that we're actually doing here is you could characterize this as a form of metamorphic testing. OK, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with metamorphic testing, I'm going to give a quick um, kind of, um, sort of lightning introduction. Metamorphic testing revolves around, it's quite a simple but powerful idea, and it revolves around this idea that you can specify what is known as a metamorphic relation. So a metamorphic relation is based on this idea that you compare outputs for two test executions. So you're not just specifying a single point value saying the program's correct if this input leads to this output. You're saying the program is correct if for a pair of inputs where I know how the second input was transformed as a result of the first one, the, re the following relationship holds. OK, so you have a source input and a follow up input, and then you reason about um, the, 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 the two outputs that you get as a result. Uh, a, a common example that's used is, for example, the sine function. So we know that there's a property where sine x has to equal sine pi minus x. So in this case, x would be the source input, pi minus x would be the follow up input, and checking that the two are equal would be the metamorphic relation. And this means that for essentially any value x, you have an oracle that will check whether the output is correct or not with respect to this metamorphic relation. Um, so essentially what we are doing is, is kind of like that. Um, one thing to bear in mind, actually, before I go on to explaining how we do it, um, when uh, Kanawala and Beeman were describing metamorphic testing as a potentially useful tool for testing computational models, they followed it up with this big caveat. They said, um, you know, however, but identifying metamorphic relations that should be satisfied by a program is challenging. And that is kind of within the metamorphic testing um, kind of literature, that is one of the overarching limitations on the technique. OK. Now, what we have here is this situation that essentially where we have a causal relationship, it implies that there is a metamorphic relationship there. OK, so if you have, for example, some edge from A to B, um, then it suggests that there should be a relationship where there's a, an effect of, of A on, on B. So changing A should lead to some change in B. So B prime cannot be the same as B. Or if you looked at a big collection of values or two collections of values where um, you've got one for the first um, input A and one for the second input A, there should be a difference between the two. OK, um, if we also look at the absence of an edge from A to C, that implies that there should also be a metamorphic relation showing that if we change input A, there should be no change in input C. OK, so what follows from that is that if you have a DAG that nicely captures all of the expected input output relationships in terms of their causality, um, you can derive what are in effect metamorphic relationships from that, um, at least in terms of equality and inequality. Um, so es essentially that gives you a, a kind of a useful model based approach to metamorphic testing. One other useful property, though, is um, if I take you back to when I was sort of talking about the sort of causal inference framework, we had the data 
and the process of anal analyzing the, the DAG and so on. These two are essentially separate. So obtaining the data and reasoning uh, about the, the causality within the data um, can be done um, completely separately. Uh, and that means that if we talk about um, sort of metamorphic testing, whereas in metamorphic testing, you tend to need to generate a follow up test case. You tend to transform the input in order to analyze the output. Um, in our context, if we have the DAG there, um, we're actually analyzing data um, wherever it comes from. We have the the estimand. We know what the process is that we need to follow to analyze the data, and we don't need to generate our data in a in a in a custom made way, in principle. Okay, so that is a sort of useful uh, a useful thing to bear in mind as well, especially if test generation is very um, cumbersome and expensive and takes a long time to collect. Um, so with that in mind, we come on to sort of our second small Covasim study. OK, so for this, we have um, a slightly more complex um, DAG. And what we're interested in is to, well, let's say the epidemiologist, the scientist is interested in sort of validating the impact of a new variant um, with maybe a, a greater level of infectiousness than they've seen before. So, for example, what happens if we switch from beta, which is the infectiousness, from 0 0.016 to 0 0.032? Okay. Uh, in reality, that corresponds to switching from the beta the beta variant to the gamma variant, um, which is a very 2020 thing to say. But the, the, that was the R. That was the kind of the, the beta. There's two betas going on here. I hope you're not. I'm, I hope I'm not confusing you. Um, so one thing you could do is to run Covasim um, and just plug in the new beta value. But the problem there is that, as we see in the DAG, there is confounding, OK? So the total number of people infected is not only affected by the infectiousness, um, but it's also uh, affected by the um, distribution, the age distribution in the country and the um, average number of household contacts. So that was just sort of the domain knowledge that was built into the model. Now, these are dotted because you can't directly fix them in Covasim. The only way you can affect them is actually by changing the location. These are hard coded in. OK, so what you have is the thing, the input that you're able to change is location. There's these confounding variables here. And you're interested in the effect of infectiousness on the total number of people infected. So the question we want to sort of briefly explore here is, can we identify causal input output effects despite confounding? Um, and could causal models be useful for in te inferring test oracles? So the way we do this, um, just to explore this in a sort of synthetic uh, way, is we picked four countries um, that we knew had very different age and contact demographics. So Bangladesh, for example, has a high age and a low contact distribution, and, and the others have, have sort of differing levels. Um, but together, they, you, you get a sort of broadly good coverage um, of, of age and contacts. Um, and then what we did was we assigned to each country a dominant variant, so a dominant beta value. So where 75% of the runs for that country would correspond to that beta value and the others would be sampled from other countries. Um, now, and then we basically generated 10,000 runs, um, which is, I accept, quite a high number um, given, given the expense of running it. Um, and we ran these runs on different random seats. Now, of course, this is a very contrived setting um, because we are at least guaranteeing a reasonable spread of age and household contacts. Um, but crucially, we're not controlling for beta. OK, so different beta rates are linked to different countries um, with their own age and contact distributions, and we are not controlling for the sort of effect um, the, the confounding effect of age and household contacts in that. So our question is, can we, using the causal inference sort of analysis, sort of still 
um, gauge um, gauge this in a realistic way. Um, so the method for this, we actually go on to the sort of regression model sort of functionality with with causal inference. So the task here is what we do is we create a regression model that links other variables, including beta, against the ultimate number of infections. And basically what we do is we sort of we um, sort of uh, learn that model by running it across the data. And then once we have the model, we just plug in the data. We, we take the data items and we replace beta with 0 0.016 and get um, get the, the average number of infections. Then we do the same for beta being 0 0.032. And then that gives us, the difference between those gives us what's known as the average treatment effect. So in order to analyze this, we look at three models. We look at one model where we just don't adjust at all for age and, and household cohabitation. And then we look at one model where we do adjust for it. And then we look at what's known as the counterfactual model, where essentially we do the same as above, but crucially, we leave out all of the data that contains the variant that is of interest. So we genuinely have to infer that from the other sort of um, dynamics in the data that we've observed. Um, so what you see here is this is the blue line is just the sort of baseline that we take without adjusting at all. Um, and you see that there's big differences between um, the different countries. So we have Mozambique, Gambia, Bangladesh, Oman. Um, and then what we do is we sort of expand this and we look at all of the countries with or Oman and Bangladesh, which have a relatively high age and Mozambique and Gambia, which have a relatively low age distribution. And then we look at all of them. So because we carefully controlled the data when we use the adjusted um, sort of um, regression model, you actually see there's a really, um, they're pretty much identical, which you'd expect. We've baked that control into the data. However, when we start trying to generalize and we group countries together and there's no longer that control within the data, then you see that actually there's pretty significant differences um, between the adjusted results um, from our sort of um, adjusted regression model and the unadjusted results. And finally, when we then take the data that we get um, where we've excluded um, the actual data that corresponds to um, 0 0.0, it actually should be 0 0.016 and 0 0.032, um, then you see that actually the inference, so this is where it's entirely relying on, on the, the actual ability to infer from the regression model, um, it does a very good job. What's particularly Surprising, I suppose, is that it does well for the case of Oman, where the 0 0.032 dominant variant was dominant. So we only had a small fraction of the, the data samples to, to go from there. Um, and then what you see is again, so basically the counterfactual um, model that is relying purely on the sort of um, data without the target variant um, does a very good job of, of, of matching the, um, the, the, the data where it did have the, the target variant in it. So that suggests that ultimately if we're looking at sort of um, inferred oracles and potentially sort of inferring behavior from, from data that we haven't yet seen, that these sorts of causal models could be very useful. Um, right. So this brings us on to the conclusions. Um, so causal DAGs are intuitive. Uh, they tend to be good for setting out input-output relationships. Um, so testing causal relationships is a, is a form of metamorphic testing. There's a useful um, relationship there that we can hopefully build on. And specifically the fact that you can test causality from observational data without needing to sort of go and deliberately generate follow-up test cases. That's useful for situations such as ours, whereas generating test cases is actually quite expensive. And it's potentially capable of detecting bugs on systems with, with large parameter sets. Um, we've still got a long way to go on this. Um, we want to sort of look at, for example, what the appropriate measures are for test adequacy. 
Um, Pearl's done a lot of symbolic reasoning with DAGs, um, and I think that could really start to fit in and enable us to reason much more deeply about um, and, and much more effectively about test data. Um, and also we're we're working very much on, on how we can refine this approach to work on other systems that are hard to test. Um, so my current PhD student Richard Summers, he's working on digital twins and cyber physical systems. Um, Andy and Michael are working on, on self-driving car simulations. Um, and also with Richard, we're looking on, on sort of self-looping looping insulin delivery systems. So they're all systems that are intrinsically um, full of challenges, very hard to test, and where this sort of approach might, might be one way to approach that. Um, and I mentioned these other people. Um, this is a very much a collaborative effort and um, uh, rests on the shoulders of, of the people here. So there's Nick Latimer uh, and David Wagg and Rob Hirons. They are the co-investigators. Um, Nick's in School of Health and Related Sciences. David Wagg is the digital twins um, sort of expert in materials. Michael Foster is, is the RA. There's two research software engineers, Bob and Chris. And then Andy and Richard um, are the PhD students who have inv invariably done a huge work, a huge amount of this work as well. Um, yes, and and uh, as it says in the top, please get in touch. I'd be very keen um, to, to to sort of investigate uh, working working together on this. Thank you Thank very you. very much. Uh, uh, very, very interesting. interesting. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, is there anyone who wants to ask the first question? Yes, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, hello, Neil. This is Jie from King's College London. Thank you very much for the great talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I feel that it's a bit tricky to, th uh, to know whether the variables we analyze are sufficient for causal analysis, right? Like whether we miss any important variables. So I wonder whether there, uh, I mean, in the literature of causal analysis, whether there is any way to measure the adequacy or sufficiency of the variables. Because when we do software testing, we, you know, we, 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 we often think about coverage. So is there any metrics such as coverage to measure the sufficiency of the variables for causal analysis. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so 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 thanks thanks Yeah, that, That's that's a, a fantastic question, and and actually it's very much um, the sort of next step that we're interested in looking at. Um, I'm not. I, I I mean, I'm sure there are techniques in causal inference that are that are that are sort of routinely used to establish. Um, whether you've got enough variables uh, or we, whether you've considered the right variables. There's certainly techniques that will tell you whether a given variable does or does not have a causal effect. And there's techniques that will tell you, um, OK, um, there's such a large error bound that we simply cannot say for certain that um, a particular variable does or does not have a causal effect. Um, so I suppose, I mean, one natural approach would be to start from these kind of indicators and then and then work from there. But um, it's something that we're still grappling with, uh, I'm afraid. Thank you. By the way, I'm a big fan of metamorphic testing. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Yeah, no. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? So uh, maybe b until the next question arrives, uh, I have a question. Very often when we look at data, there are not enough counterfactuals to kind of va validate the results. How, how do you deal with that? Um, we, we, we have had several cases where we looked at the data and there were not enough uh, cases where we could use as counterfactuals. Uh, is that an issue for your approach at all? When you say cases that you could use as counterfactuals, um, I'm not entirely sure how to interpret that. So, for example, we, we, when we want to verify that um, a certain variable uh, is causal, even even in a binary sense. So, suppose we are not looking at 
the amount of uh, influence of a variable, but whether a, va a certain variable is causal at all or not. I mean, uh, that also goes back to the question of GA. For, for that, in order to validate whether that variable is counterfactual, whether it's causal or not, we need to look at the counterfactuals, right, to see whether um, in, in those interventions where that variable didn't change, the result changed or not, right? Mm -hmm. And and very often uh, when, when we look at, for example, um, uh, medical data, but also cyber physical systems data, there are not enough counterfactuals available in the data. Is that an issue you have seen or? or? So so the way I mean, maybe we're interpreting counterfactuals slightly differently. Um, so when, when I talk about a counterfactual, it is um, something for which there is absolutely no example in the data at all. I see. I see. No, no, no. Okay, so for what what I mean by counterfactual is, uh, 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 for example, an execution of the system where the variable where you were considering as causal didn't change, and hence you can use it as, um, or, or did change due to an inter intervention, and you can look look at that change to see whether that that change is causal or not or for the effect. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, so I suppose what you're talking about. So for that. I think we'd we'd be sort of just looking to sort of establish whether that is a causal effect or not. Uh, and yes, so there are absolutely circumstances where there simply isn't enough data there at a hundred percent. Yes, um, I think that probably ties ties back to um, the, the previous question on on adequacy, right? So if there isn't enough data there to to sort of simply establish that um, a, there is a causal relationship in the, the that a causal relationship in the DAG is substantiated or not that there's not enough test data there and that's that would be you need are, to make more. Are you aware of any approaches where you could kind of approximate that because there might be another run which is not exactly the result of the intervention but maybe a slightly different uh, there is some noise or there is there there are some slight uh, changes in the other variables uh, yeah, and, and that, that's essentially where the regression models come in. OK, so essentially what, what you do is you kind of you analyze, you've got the data, you derive your regression models from that. The DAG lets you focus these models on a relatively low number of variables, hopefully, which means that actually you don't need that much data or as much data as you would to get a reasonably accurate model. And then the better your inference algorithm is, the better the regression model is, the more accurate your your kind of your your reasoning is as a result. Uh, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, I think we are running out of time. We, we, we are at the clock right now. Unless there are any burning questions, I suggest we take the uh, the rest of the questions offline. And our invitation uh, for you and your group to visit us. Uh, always remains there. It would be lovely to talk about, especially those cases that, that concern cyber physical systems, autonomous vehicles. I think there, there is a lot to, to chat about and, and discuss in the future. Thank you very much, Neil, for having joined us. It was really a nice talk, uh, lots of interesting points.